welcome to the first ever episode of the Dennis Rillo Howell Show. In each episode, I will have conversations with people in the fields of psychology, mental health, and well-being to help you gain a greater understanding of human behavior and of yourself. I'm very excited to have Dr. Bernie Wilkinson and Dr. Richard Marshall as my first ever guests. As some of you might already be aware, they are the brilliant hosts of The Mental Breakdown, which is, of course, co-branded with Cybridge Podcast. So welcome, Dr. Bernie Wilkinson and Dr. Richard Marshall. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. Hello. Of course, um, I'm already familiar with what you do. Uh, we've been collaborating for a couple of years now. Um, you were actually keynote speakers at uh, the past two conferences that I've organized um, in ICPCE 2018, which was held in the Philippines, and also ICPC 2019, which was held last month in, in Malaysia. But for the benefit of our audience, can you please tell me about your professional backgrounds? I suppose we can start with Dr. Um, Marshall. Dan, it's good to be here. It's good to see you again. Um, I've spent, uh, most of my time has been in teaching hospitals and medical centers. Uh, but about 20 years ago, 18 years ago, I moved to uh, Florida to help take care of my parents. Uh, I had three young children at the time and uh, began teaching at a university here. Um, did that for about 18 years and, and retired and went into private practice full time with Dr. Bernie. Uh, that was about five years ago now. So my background is in um, educational psychology and neuropsychology. And um, my practice, the practice here at PAC Florida, uh, we have a, Dr. Bernie and I started a practice here called Psychological Associates of Central Florida five years ago. And we do a full range of forensic, developmental, uh, pediatric, uh, couples therapy um, here in Lakeland, Florida. So that's my full-time position now. Thank you. All right. Well, yeah, um, as for, what about you? Uh, uh, as for me, um, well, I work in the same practice, but um, and, and my background is very similar. I, I have my uh, doctorate degree in school psychology, and so um, I've had some experience working in the schools, but over the past, goodness, 15, 20 years or so, mm -hmm. have been working primarily in uh, clinical or private practices, uh, both at the university as well as in private clinic settings, um, doing forensic, uh, neuropsychological, clinical couples, family uh, therapy, and um, assessments and evaluations. Um, currently, I'm working in the local public schools here in, in our area. Uh, I do that during the, during the day. And then in the evenings, I come here and I see some patients and, and work with individuals um, with their, for their mental health needs and uh, couples and families for their uh, behavioral and emotional needs. So yeah. that's about mine. Yeah. You're, you're very busy and you still um, work during the weekends. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, th thank you for um, telling us about your background. It's a, it's, a very, um, it's a very interesting background. You're very busy. Um, one of the most read articles on Psychreg is a list of potential research topics in psychology. So just out of research interest, what were your re research dissertation topics for your PhD, um, Mr. Um, Dr. Wilkinson? Um, for my, in my program, I had to do a research thesis for my education specialist degree, and that was a study where I looked at the effects of uh, the, the stress-related effects of having a child with Tourette's disorder on, on parents and um, families. Uh, so that was a survey study that I conducted uh, along with the Tourette Syndrome Association of America. Um, and it covered five different states here in, uh, primarily in the southeastern United States area. Um, for my doctoral dissertation, I was looking at some similar issues related to stress and, and parent perceived uh, angst as it relates to having a child with medical, uh, an infant or toddler with medical or developmental uh, delays or disabilities. So very similar related to looking at uh, the impact on the parent of having a child with some various difficulties. And uh, what about you, Dr. Marshall? Um, can you tell us a bit more about your PhD topic? Yes, but I'm always a little bit embarrassed when this topic comes up because I've done two. Okay. <laughs> so um, One wasn't know, enough. No, so I had to do two. <laughs> some, people, some people are smart enough to just have to do one and others it takes two tries to get it right. Um, my first dissertation was on the, uh, I was working in a um, neurology clinic 
at a teaching hospital. And the topic was the um, effects of anti-epileptic anti medications um, on behavior, uh, learning, and memory in school-age children. These are children who were initially diagnosed. They had never been on medication before. And we wanted to test the effects of the medication on their cognitive abilities. Uh, my second dissertation was done at the University of Georgia. And um, at the time, uh, DSM-4 was just being um, developed. And as you know, that's the diagnostic and statistical manual that we use. And I happened to be working with a person who was on the study group for DSM-4, and they wanted to collect more information on the ADD portion of ADHD. What, what is it about these? Do we really have a definable group who only have inattention and not hyperactivity? And so my second dissertation was on the characteristics of students with ADD, um, the, the inattention and um, disinhibition. Um, and we found, that, um, we found that there were some interesting findings with girls mm -hmm. because girls typically don't misbehave, so they don't bring themselves to the attention of clinicians, and so they're under, it's underreported, and they, the, they have a tendency to suffer in silence rather than bring themselves to the attention of uh, caregivers. And, and just to be clear, because he's being a little bit modest about this, he, he did it. He did two because he has two doctorates. He has an education, a doctor in education, and a and a PhD. So, the lucky he didn't do well on it enough, and so he had to do the, another one. He he has two doctoral degrees, so that's why I had two. So oh, in, in, interesting. I've I've never come across um with two people with um two doctorates, but I. Do um, I, I've seen people who has um, a PhD and also um, an MD. Uh, yes, yeah. I, I, so I suppose it's, it's interesting because you, you, you're trying to um, just just carry on doing research in your area. Yeah, yeah. Um, our research, our it's probably interesting, and maybe this is a good time to talk about it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, Dr. Bernie and I have done, because we've spent most of our time in hospitals, is we do what's called much of our research is translational research. And that is that we're taking complicated medical uh, topics and translating them so that parents and teachers have access to that information. You know, typically parents and teachers aren't going to read medical journals or psychiatric journals. Uh, we do, we, we know how to do that, and we translate that information for parents and teachers. Interesting. And um, you, you, you already mentioned that you've done, um, you, you, you've mentioned your research topics for your dissertation and your backgrounds, your, your qualifications. Um, I'm just um, interested, um, has, has it always been what you wanted to do? Because in my case, um, doing psychology was purely accidental. Um, I really did not enjoy um, doing psychology until I was in my second year. I, I toyed on the idea of doing um, something about politics or something about journalism. But uh, I just <laughs> I just lingered on psychology. Um, has, has it always been um, education and psychology for you, for you? From from our conversation when we were in Malaysia, I think you would have done very well in politics. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm quite at political. The, at that that chicken and rice uh, restaurant that we went to, it was great. Um, but for me, it was it was not always psychology. Um, I think that I. I changed my major a good dozen or so times uh, throughout my undergraduate years, uh, and it wasn't until my the end of my junior year in in college that I started doing some research with a, a psychiatrist in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of South Florida, and uh, from that point I was I was pretty hooked. He uh, he, he was a pretty brilliant individual who, um, and he was. Very, he was an older man. Uh, he was in his early 90s when I started working with him, but he just had a, had a view and a, a way to look at children and, and teenagers that was, was amazing and really hooked me in. And that's, that's when I really took into uh, psychology. So. Right. And mine, mine too was quite by accident. Um, certainly, um, I did the same thing. We, we tend to change majors numerous times as undergraduates. Um, but when I graduated from did my undergraduate studies, I began teaching. And that led to um, assuming um, an administrative position at a private school in Pennsylvania. And it was at that private school where I suddenly assumed a responsibility for children who were unable to learn. And at the time, 
uh, I didn't know what we were dealing with. Now I know they had learning disabilities. Um, and so that got me interested in how the brain learns. And that's why I went back to school to pursue doctoral studies and how I ended up in a department of neurology because I wanted to know more about how the brain learns. That degree was in education. And then for further study, I wanted to do another neurology. That's why I happened to end up quite by accident with a second, second degree because I wanted to get more in-depth study on the human mm -hmm. brain. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But yes, all of it was accidental. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, so um, basically, um, be, being um, a psychologist and an educator is, is it's um, it's a process. Um, you, usually, um, those who are practitioners, they don't really plan to be psychologists or educators. Um, it, it's 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 a process. Um, yes. So, wh when it comes to practicing and teaching psychology, what would you consider as your key pillars and your foundation principles? I, I suppose what? what's your what's your key approach with your clients and when it comes to teaching um, future mm -hmm. psychologists? What's your um, key pillars? Um, I, I think that I, I know for myself, I use a, mm -hmm. a pretty eclectic uh, approach to working with with individuals and, and, and patients and clients because I try to, you know, through through this um, study various disciplines or various um, schools of thought as it relates to theories for behavior and, and emotion and, and, and everything. And it's my perspective that a lot of times, you know, different patients will want or need different things. And so, you know, some patients really like the um, psychoanalytic style, um, not that I'm a, a, an analyst in any way, uh, but they like, they like talking about dreams and they like talking about sort of this idea of the subconscious and things like that and so you know i, I will i will bring that to them when we're, when we're having those conversations and but many uh, patients prefer uh, more of a cognitive or cognitive behavioral approach um, some children that we work with need a behavioral approach and so you know for for my um work i try to bring whatever it is that the the client seems to um, be there looking for, and I, I try to offer as much of that as I can. Right. Certainly, I think our approach is um, because one of the things that happens here in our private practice is we tend to get very difficult cases. Right. Uh, we end up, for some reason, we end up with very difficult cases. So, by necessity, um, our practice, uh, our practice approach must be eclectic because we deal with so many different kinds of problems. That said. Um, I think I, I, I think I bring three perspectives. I was thinking about this as you asked the question. And the first perspective, of course, is brain-based. Uh, we, we have this uh, brain-based background, this neuropsychological background. So I think much Everything of our- begins with the brain. Right, much of our work is infused uh, with an understanding of how the brain works. A second is that um, I believe in, in uh, choice theory that was uh, developed by uh, William Glasser but certainly has spread beyond that. I think people have responsibility um, and have to make choices. Um, not, that, not that they make choices to behave badly, but I think they have to make a choice about their own care. And so they have to be brought into the therapeutic process. So I think the third perspective is um, that the, that the uh, do, do it to a client, we work with a patient, and the goal is, is to become, and I want to use the term normal here, I want to get to normal. I don't want my patients to have to rely on me, right. have to depend on me long term. We typically don't do long term therapy. Right. Ours is a very problem focused, mm -hmm. problem solving approach where we um, try to understand the problem, try to understand what this person is dealing with, and help them get out of whatever. Um, mm -hmm problem they have themselves um, in. That said, of course, there are chronic conditions right. that have to be managed. But typically, uh, if you work with patients, uh, the goal is to get them to normal, to get right. them out of this, this state that they're in right now. Yeah, we see, we see, we tend to see ourselves just from our conversations, we tend right. to see ourselves more um, like coaches and, and support, you know, educators, right. for the most part, as, mm -hmm. as you, you, you alluded to, Dan. Um, you know, we're, we're working to educate our patients. We're, we don't have that perspective of sort of old um, analysts and, and, um, and those who see us as um, almost as parental figures to, to yeah. patients. Um, we don't really 
approach it from that perspective. We're, yeah. we're more like coaches. And we talk about this often um, that sometimes people come in here and they they arrive as though we have some magic box, like some black bag that we carry around that, well, I, I can solve your problems. We, we can't solve your problems. We can be part of the solution, right. but the solution, the work is really up to you. Um, if, if we're dealing with children, typically that's a family problem. Right. Um, we can get the child to behave here, but the child has to behave at home or in school. And so that's where we become supports for the primary caregivers. Right. So I, I, I think um, your, your, your approach um, does not really differ with most um, um, psychotherapists and um, coaches because ultimately um, the, the psychotherapeutic process is just a way to help people realize the kind of situation that they, they're into. And at the end of the day, they have um, the, uh, they, they're accountable for that and they can help themselves. You're, you're just part of, part of the process as you've said. Right, yeah. right. Now, um, you briefly mentioned earlier that you you also educate those and you also have written books. I, I just um, want to um, um, point out to our listeners that you've written a number of books. Um, can you please tell us a bit about the handbook for raising an emotionally healthy child? You've you've done a lot of work. Um, you've done a lot of work with children and with other clients as well. But um, what what's with that book? Um, so that book was born out of a, a workshop that I did at the University of South Florida uh, in one May, uh, which is, I guess, Mental Health. I don't know if it's Mental Health Awareness Month or Mental Health Month or, or something to that effect. And each week was designated something different. And I remember it was on a, um, it, was, it was the week before, uh, that, so it was a, the last week of um, April. And my department chair came to me and said, uh, Bernie, we'd like for you to do a, a community workshop next week on children's mental health. And I said, okay. Uh, of course, he always, he always says, okay. He gets us into terrible dilemmas here. He always says, oh, sure, we can do that. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so under a bit of pressure, what I thought of was, you know, let's, let me, I'm just going to do something talking about what it takes to raise a, a healthy child. And, and I came up you know, kind of generated these three ideas of, um, uh, of the behavior, uh, behavioral management, attention, and, and love. And uh, so I did this quick, it was like a 45 minute. And I started talking about that idea and we really um, worked to expand it over the, over the subsequent years. And so we developed, wrote this book that has uh, three sections of, behavior management, attention, and love. And when we talk about uh, this, this necessary three-tiered, uh, three-legged stool that, that is um, parenting and, and working to raise, raise healthy children. And so we, we published the first edition back in 2012, and that was a self-published uh, physical hard, hardback book mm -hmm. uh, or paperback either way. Um, and we've been working to revise the book. Uh, and those have been those the first two sections have been released as eBooks uh, through Amazon, uh, through Amazon Kindle. And um, so we had the behavior management and the attention sections are both available uh, already as revised editions. And we're working on the, the love section now. Interesting. I think, hello. Yes. I thought, I'm sorry, I, I, I thought we got disconnected. Well, you know, we have technology. Um, now, the other, the other thing that we should mention about that book is that um, in the process of writing it, um, we stumbled, one, we, we read on Sunday mornings. Uh, we would meet every Sunday morning at a conference table, and, um, and we would write sections of the book. And one morning, we stumbled on the concept of spare the rod, spoil the child. Uh, this was quite unintended. But we live in an area where um, spanking is allowed. It's one of the 22 states where, or 27 states where, where paddling is still allowed. Um, and we thought, well, we better come to terms with this because we're in sort of a conservative community. And in the process, we learned that um, we, went, we went back and translated that phrase from, of course, from the Bible and learned that, uh, in fact, it's not in every Bible, right? The, that, that whole phrase, that whole concept isn't in the Bible. But after we worked through it, we discovered that um, the, the idea of 
spare the rod, spoil the child is really about teaching children, not punishing children. And so without going into great detail, the theme of that book um, became teach, don't punish. And, and, and it was on that basis. That's sort of the underlying theme of that, that book is teach rather than punish. Mm -hmm. that, 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 um, that actually reminds me of um, a controversial documentary in the UK. I think that it was about two months ago, Channel 4. Um, they did a documentary. Um, the, the title was um, Discipline Your Child Like You Would Discipline a Dog. I, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was like that. And it was, um, it was controversial here because um, um, a lot of psychologists said that you have to discipline your, you, you have to treat your child um, as, a, as an individual. Um, it's not just a, a series of stimulus response um, process. But uh, uh, I, I, can see, I can see where you're coming from, that um, you, have to, you have to be um, not too rigid with um, imposing discipline with your children, but you have to take into account um, other practices as well. Um, Absolutely. I, I, I'm going to try to find that, that documentary you're talking about because I was, just, I was just meeting in one of my schools this past yeah. week and um, I, told, I was encouraging opposed to raising our voice and yelling and, you know, being mm. demanding and, and imposing in that way, that we should talk to them as though they're individuals and that mm -hmm. as though they have, you know, just as many ideas and thoughts and feelings as we do. Um, um, th th thank you for talking about your, your book. And um, ju just to make it clear, there's actually two parts of that book and it's uh, available in Amazon. Now, um, of course, you're very DC and um, I'm really thankful that you managed to be um, to take part in the first episode of this show. Um, you have your own clinical practice. You also teach and you've written books. Um, what prompted you to launch a podcast as well? And how do you manage your time? Um, well, why, why did you launch a podcast? Well, um, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I'm going to just sit here and listen to this answer. <laughs> yeah. I had an idea. <laughs> that, wait, 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 wait. That's how this all starts. Where, 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 hey, Richard, I have an idea. And I know I'm in trouble because this idea is going to translate into even more hours uh, every week. So I have an idea. I, had an, I have an idea. And so I had an idea because, as Richard said earlier, you know, one of the things that we really work hard to do is is to translate uh, complicated research and, and medical and, and psychological information and try to break it down mm -hmm. um, where the mental breakdown came from. We try to break down that information so that parents and teachers and kids, um, anyone can understand it and, and apply it into their life on a, on a daily basis. And, um, you know, we, we do that in our clinical practice and it's, it's challenging because at most we can, we can see maybe eight to 10 people a day. Um, whereas if we did a podcast or if we did, if we did some writing in, in, in a podcast, um, especially if we put that podcast on YouTube, um, then we could reach many, many more people uh, without, you know, without any extra work, without having to you know, create extra hours in the day, we can, we can reach many more people and, and share some of the information and some of the some of this um, some of these strategies and skills um, and so that's how we launched it right and it and it became part of what we call dissemination right um, we, we do have a private practice we teach mm -hmm. but we also felt uh, an obligation if you will mm -hmm. to uh, disseminate information and so how do you disseminate information well one thing you can do is write books you can publish articles you can have a blog post you can have a podcast so it became uh, one um, way of getting information out to a larger audience. And it, it is, uh, in fact, now we have in, in the private practice, now that we have eight clinicians, we're talking about having one of the clinicians take responsibility for the dissemination part of our private practice because it's grown to the point where we're going to have to have somebody else manage it for us. But we'll do the work, but somebody else has to manage the different components, including the podcast. 
Mm -hmm. I, I suppose what practitioners like yourselves are trying to do, as what Dr. Wilkinson has said, is that you're contributing to the translation of knowledge into practice. Um, right. Of course, it's, it's one thing um, for people to be well educated, to attend seminars and conferences and to do lots of readings. But it's a significant challenge to see how they are translated into practice. So mm -hmm. what, what, what's your comment on, on that space? Like, um, well, I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that um, how, how could we be, for, for, for those who are aspiring to be practitioners, how, how could we be better practitioners? Um, well, I, I think that, the, I think that the, the first part is that, um, and, and I certainly recognize this, you know, sort of a, um, a, a, a come to real life um, um, a, appreciation that came about after I left the university that I was working at and started working in private practice because I had this sort of ideal that I was going to, you know, have this practice where I could reach those who, who needed it most. Um, and, and those were people who, you know, here in the States, we don't have universal health care. We don't have um, systems in place where people who don't have insurance or don't have the financial re um, means to be able to gain access to, to good uh, mental health care. And so those people by and large go without. And so, you know, Richard and I talked for many years about this is the type of practice that we want to have. And then we were struck with the realization that that is not possible. I mean, it's really difficult to, to sustain a private practice without government funds and without grants and all these kinds of things that would take, you know, a, another person, you know, a full-time um, employment to, to write, write all that, all those grants and paperwork and everything. And so, you know, we had to sort of fall into line with so many other practitioners of taking insurance and, and having fees set at a, at a rate that, can sustain a practice. And, um, you know, for us, the podcast and the blog and some of these other uh, approaches is a way to reach more people that couldn't otherwise be reached, that, that can't come in for, uh, for uh, appointments or, or be seen on a regular basis. We can at least, you know, get emails from them and they say, hey, could you do a podcast where you talk about this? And we could do a podcast where we talk about it so that they can have some strategies and some ideas, just like we would have in a therapeutic session but we can offer to them sort of informationally that way and give them at least a start um, to work towards the way that, you know, into the direction of you know, some healing. Right. Yeah, I think if I were to advise um, young people who are getting into the field, I think the first piece of advice that I would give them is to rid themselves of all the um, folklore about why people do the things that they do or why children act the way that they do. Um, you know, this whole idea, people will come in and say, well, I was spanked and I turned out okay, or um, this happened to me and I'm all right, or I pulled myself up by the bootstraps. Um, I think people have to get rid of those notions, you know, that I did it myself. I don't know anybody who did it, him or herself. Uh, we all have supports. And then replace that sort of what I call folklore of why people do the things they do with knowledge and especially, I don't like the term evidence-based practice because I think that too can be abused mm -hmm. uh, because there are, um, I think our, our knowledge has to go beyond evidence-based practices. But I think you have to inform yourself, take the issue of spanking. Um, so we say, okay, stop spanking, um, get rid of that notion that somehow spanking is okay because it's not very effective, especially for children older than five. I mean, there are reams of research papers that show that it's just not very effective uh, besides being dangerous. Right. And so really get the information, um, get, and I don't like the word facts because there aren't many. Right. And so, but get all the evidence you can and then base your practice on the right. evidence that's available uh, rather, than the, uh, rather than what happened to you or what you think is going to work mm -hmm. well. Later today, we're going to do our own podcast, and we're going to talk about hubris, which is um, um, being sure when you shouldn't be. Right. You know? So be careful of hubris, because that's, a, that's, the, uh, that's the, just the opposite of what we should be doing. Right. Right? Get the evidence that we have. You know, we have these problems like climate change and other political issues uh, that come up. Um, hundreds of scientists believe that there's climate change. I don't have enough information to debate that. I mean, it, it's silly for me to debate those topics. There is evidence available, and that's what, that's what psychologists should be using. 
I, I think I think it's best to look at what, whatever discipline it is, be it psychology or cli climate science. It's it's best to look at, at um, on the basis of what's the av available evidence. And That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's best to have a suspended, I suppose, um, a delayed judgment um, until you have all the evidence. Right. Um, and go, going back to your um, clinical practice, um, based on your experience, um, what would you consider as the biggest barrier to treatment um, for people uh, with, mental, with mental illness? The biggest barrier? Um, probably, probably the, well, I see two massive barriers. One is access. Access, um, access has, to, has got to be the biggest. And, you know, we are, we have seven clinicians here in our practice. Um, and every one of us, see as many patients as we can every day, every week, every month. And there are still people who call and we just can't get them in uh, to be seen. So I, I think that the first barrier is access and, and you know, ac especially accessing, accessing quality mental health care. Um, we have community health resources that, um, community mental health resources that, that are okay and, and work well for some people, but it, they also have limitations themselves. Um, and I think that the second barrier is uh, sort of what, what, what Richard mentioned a few minutes ago, and that is you, you know, what the patient brings with them. And that's oftentimes uh, a belief or an assumption that we have a, a magic remedy. Um, and so, you know, so much of our time is spent educating them that no, you know, you'll come in and we'll kind of, t we'll talk about things and I'll give you some strategies or give you some ways to maybe look at it a little bit differently, but you've got to do the work. You, you've got to, you know, implement some of these things and do, do the work the other 167 hours a week. Right. That's up to you. You only see me once. So uh, for that one hour. And, and I think that, so that barrier of, of just educating the patient is really, really challenging sometimes. Right. Yeah, I would agree that the first obstacle, at least in our country, is access. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a mangled insurance system that's very, very complicated and seeks to deny coverage as much as possible right. rather, than, rather than give access. So I think the first problem is access. Second problem that I deal with is what I would call myths and myths, misconceptions. Um, people come in and say, well, I don't, I don't want to do medication. I don't believe in medication then you know that we have this controversy about vaccines in our country. Um, and people come in with these misconceptions, this misunderstanding, and, th and they come in and say, well, I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to do that, and I'm not, I don't want to do this, and I don't want to do that. And those are, those are misunderstandings that they have about, about, about the process. Okay. And I mean, that's the second obstacle. Okay. And they begin with, they begin with um, a conclusion and say, well, I'm not going to do this. Well, then it really restricts what you can right. do as a practitioner. That, that leads me to um, the second, um, to the last question. Um, I've, come with, I've come across with some practitioners who have met people with anosognosia. Um, have, for the benefit of our readers, um, anosognosia is also known as lack of insight. Um, it's a symptom of severe mental illness um, experienced by some people that impairs the um, ability to understand that they have an illness. So um, as practitioners, um, have you ever come across with people who have anosognosia um, and how, how did you deal with these people with um, neuropsychiatric disorder? Just, just linking to, um, you, you mentioned earlier, that, that the barriers. I, I think that uh, certainly have. Um, you know, insight is, is, an, um, is this silent um, necessity. Uh, we, we, we must have insight if, if we hope to, um, to, to be able to gain an appreciation and to be able to employ most of the strategies and, and skills that we, we try to teach therapeutically. Uh, we did a podcast um, some time ago on um, egocentonic versus egodystonic. And, and egocentonic is, is exactly that, a person who sees them, you know, doesn't see anything wrong with themselves and in fact thinks no matter how disordered their thinking is, Things that everybody else must think the same way as well. Uh, we see that a lot in personality disorders and, and, and those kinds of conditions. Uh, whereas the ego dystonic for people who see themselves as they can see their symptoms differently and, and they can see that I'm not supposed to feel this way because nobody else feels this way. Um, and so that, that uh, tendency or that 
phenomenon, I guess, of, of not having the adequate insight necessary to sit back and reflect on your, yourself and your own um, behavior and, and views of the world to be able to, you know, give yourself a, a good assessment and say, you know, I, I think that I need to change this or I think that this is a problem. I, I think that that's a massive skill that is, is lost in some people and that we really spend a lot of time trying to build that, um, but it takes time. Mm -hmm. You're talking about lack of insight in the patient. Yes. Then, correct? Okay. Right. Yeah, because it, it really limits what you can do. Right. We see this especially in young children. I mean, what's the problem with very young children? Is they lack insight. I mean, mm -hmm. it's hard to say, honey, this is what your problem is, you know, because they lack the insight right. to, to, they don't have the vocabulary or the insight. But we also see that with adults. And if adults lack insight, it's very difficult to work with them. You almost have to work with them as children where you do a simpler behavioral approach. Well, at least you can change the behavior, right. even if you have no insight into why you're doing what you're doing. Thank you. Um, so this leads, um, that, that's basically um, all, all the questions that I want to ask you. But um, I'll be asking these questions to all, all of my future guests on this show. Uh, my last question is, what's your unpopular opinion about mental health or psychology? Uh, I suppose I can start uh, with my unpopular opinion. I think that um, when we talk about mental health, we tend to glamorize about mental health, especially um, people in um, or people who are doing podcasts, people in social media, they, they tend to glamorize mental health. I think that's one of my most unpopular opinion about mental health. Do you have any unpopular opinion about psychology or mental health? I think that my, if, if we considered an unpopular belief would be the um, sort of the bandwagoning. Um, I, I, have a, I have a big issue with, um, and this is probably dates back to that, that early training that I had starting when I was a junior in, in undergraduate um, and I worked with that psychiatrist. The, the thing that he emphasized the most was an appropriate, accurate diagnosis. And I, I think that my most, probably unpopular um, uh, opinion would be that we have a, there's a lot of practitioners who look at symptoms and apply a diagnosis without really knowing what the diagnosis or what the illness is. And so we end up with, you know, some areas that have, you know, 20% of kids diagnosed with ADHD when 20% of the kids do not have ADHD. Uh, they are in, in settings where the expectations are just incredibly too high um, and, and exceed what is developmentally appropriate. Um, we have situations where, what is it, one in 50 or one in 60 kids have, uh, are diagnosed with autism. One in 60 kids don't have autism. Um, they, they are diagnosed with that because they have, um, they have language delays or they have some other uh, quirky behaviors. And so they see a practitioner who just looks at those symptoms and applies that diagnosis. And then we get into this, um, get, get along this pathway where, you know, we see kids that have these diagnoses and, um, and that's not what they have. And, and so our, our treatment can't be correct if our diagnosis is incorrect. And so we have to, we have to do better as practitioners at identifying and, and recognizing what the condition actually is. What, you know, what is autism? Not what are the symptoms? What, how does it manifest? But what is autism? And then, then we can make our appropriate diagnoses. I think I, I don't know. I, it's an interesting question. Um, I think the first, the first point I would make is that practitioners have to keep up to date. Yes. There are many people who get a degree and don't really learn much beyond what they knew when the degree was first granted. They don't stay that, up to the That's why I'm popular. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's one thing. The second one is that there are many practitioners who have a limited number of intervention approaches and mm. they believe that if, so, so they, don't, they don't use an eclectic approach, they have an eclectic group of patients. They have patients who bring them different problems, but they tend to use the same approach with every problem. That idea of if all you have is a hammer, every problem is a nail. Um, and, and I think we need to move beyond that. I think more of us should become a little bit more eclectic. And then the third thing is blaming the patient. Um, I have an approach and I'm good at this and I'm successful and I've been successful. And if, and if you're not getting better, it's somehow the patient's fault. 
It's never the patient's fault. It is our responsibility, not the patient's responsibility. Um, and, and that's the other thing that bothers me is that frequently people will come in, come into our practice and, and say, well, I was told to do this or told to do that. And I was told that I was somehow fail. No, the patient doesn't fail. The, the practitioner fails. Yeah. Um, th thank you for those um, insights. So um, that's all I have for you, um, Dr. Bernie Wilkinson, Dr. Richard Marshall. Um, it's been an in um, insightful conversation with you. Um, I look forward to future collaborations with you. Um, I'm actually um, co-authoring a book with um, Dr. Wilkinson and Dr. Marshall. Um, we're in the process of finalizing it. Um, and um, hopefully I could um, have you on my um, future um, conferences. Um, thank you for being on the show, and I look forward to your podcast. Well, well thank you. We, we, thank it you was our pleasure, and it was thank you for inviting us to be your your first uh, first guest. Since you were the first guest that we had on uh, first interview guest that we had on our yeah. podcast, it's our pleasure to be the first guest on yours. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm.